Well, good evening, everyone. Whether it's evening for you or daytime for you, I'm Peggy George, and I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. So it is Saturday evening for me, but I know for most of you, it's Sunday afternoon, I believe. So welcome to all of you. I am very excited to introduce our special guest for this presentation, Megan Ayama. And she is the director of Tech Coach HQ. And her session title tonight is How Digital Humanitarianism United a Community. Megan describes herself as an online mobile and social media strategist who is passionate about adult learning and technology. As a classroom educator, adult trainer, and techno geek, Megan combined her passions for education and technology and founded her very own business, Tech Coach HQ. And she works with businesses and their teams to improve processes and productivity through the use of technology. She's been working with companies such as Teamboard, Pearson, to help deliver innovative ICT teacher training and PD to teachers not only in Australia, but overseas and around the world. So we want to thank you so much, Megan, for doing this tonight. And I'm going to just go right on to say, a real special thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters, to Blackboard Collaborate, and to Steve Hargadon for providing all of these rooms for our conference, to the Australia E-Series, to Cyber Academy, and two very important people that have been huge organizers and supporters for our conference, Shambles Guru at shambles.net and Coach Carol at coachcarol.net. And of course, the Learning Revolution Project, which is the brainchild of Steve Hargadon. And also a huge thank you to all of the moderators and the people that have been working behind the scenes, putting in so much time to make this such a wonderful conference for all of us. So with that, let's just take one quick moment to get our uh, smiley faces on the map to show where we're all located. And I know you all know that routine. So you can just drag your little mark right up there onto the map. I accidentally clicked on the starburst that it happened. I'm putting my little smiley face in Phoenix, Arizona, which is in GMT minus 7. And the rest of you are all clustered over there in Australia. Thanks so much. And we'll just move right on now to Megan and her presentation. Thanks a lot, Megan. Thanks very much, Peggy. So the topic is um, how did your humanitarianism unite a community? And this, this topic is really close to my heart. I actually presented on this um, last year for Anne Merchants um, for the E-Series. And again, at ULEARN at their conference in October in New Zealand. And so it's a, it's a really powerful topic and it's something that we can all take something from. So I'm just going to move on to the first slide. So where digital humanitarianism actually came out of was um, the Haiti earthquake. And what they noticed were people were using their mobile phones to capture information and to really look at what was going on. So um, it was examples of social media and new technologies becoming central to humanitarian aid and disasters. Um, other examples were the Christchurch earthquake, so both in um, 2010 and more deadly one in uh, January 2011, Queensland floods, uh, sort of up in Brisbane and around those areas, the Tasmanian bushfires, which were January last year, the Boston Marathon, Typhoon Haiyan, and a few others. So, you know, it's really actually making a um, difference. And Peggy's just commented, social media and mobile phones gets information out so much quicker, and it's definitely the truth. So the thing that I wanted to talk about was where, you know, what's been talked about, and I highly recommend Paul Connolly um, talking from the Red Cross, the TED Talk, and it really talks about all the examples um, that go on with um, 
what was pushing the behaviour earthquake and what happened out of there. So if you ever have time, TED Talk um, is highly worth recommending. So this is just an example of Haiti. So someone's on their mobile phone um, helping out with, um, you know, helping someone who's injured calling for help. So and this is what they found. They could actually map, they were doing what we call crisis mapping, so pinpointing actually where people needed help um, because it was the only way of communication. And I definitely know with um, the Tasmanian bushfires, the mobile phones was a clear way of indicating where the fires were and what was actually going on. So much so that the um, bushfires in Sydney last year in October, um, what was happening was that the fire service now is worked out that tweets are basically a way of mapping exactly where the fires are or anything that's new that's coming through and they feed that through and see exactly and are able to map at the exact location. So that's where um, you know it started to use in Haiti. But um, I guess another example of, and it's slightly different, was the student army. Um, and this is side by Sam, the first earthquake. And basically they set up the student army to one of the universities. And um, obviously the second you know, they have their systems in place to help out. One of the programs that they actually used was GEDOP. Uh, so once the student army got in and basically helped move um, all the rubble and they deployed people to clean up, um, like with any earthquakes, but especially in New Zealand. Um, when the road split, basically all this, um, there's a technical word for it, the stuff that comes out of here and it just silt everything else like that and you know rubble and, and helping you know get services and supplies um, because they were able to and they basically sent out the GEOP which is a program that comes out of New Zealand and it's actually used for business, so the Kiwi business um, and they were able to deploy um, people to exactly the right places at the right time and they had text message and they, that's how they pulled everyone together and they were able to get an amazing a group of people um, on this program. So, you know, um, there's definitely a lot of lessons to be learned. But this is uh, something that I just came up yesterday. So it says MicroMapper collects disaster related tweets which contain geolocation um, information that may be asking or offering help reporting that there are injured people cautioning others to stay away because the building, road, bridge or some other infrastructure is damaged or destroyed. Yes, I think it's actually an app, Peggy. Um, and that instead of simply offering sympathy to the victims. So basically, um, they're sorting through what's actually helpful and what's not. And I know, especially as Typhoon and Hyann, this was a really crucial thing because um, it was not just, it was all the information that needed to be on the ground. And of course, the majority of people, the more people and more are having mobile phones, whether it's smartphones and they're, this is where they're mapping that information that's coming in so that um, aid services can get there a lot uh, more quicker than perhaps they would have been able to in the past. So this is a really um, interesting thing. So this is um, about Typhoon Land. This is one of the featured projects. So this is the humanitarian open street map team. And so it applies the principles of open source and open data, um, sharing for humanitarian response. So you can see, um, with, um, sorry about that Ian. Um, it's basically about mapping information so that, um, you know, in real time, so you can see, like with, even with Google Maps, you can see where um, parts have been destroyed. Whereas before, you'd have to actually wait until you got someone on the ground. And especially with Typhoon Land, that was very difficult. It was very difficult to actually get people through um, for aid services. Google Crisis Maps is um, something that was another thing that was um, deployed. And Google has a service also, for example, when um, a crisis happens. Um, I couldn't definitely I'm not understand information with these maps. But what happened when it was the Boston Marathon was they Google set up a website. Um, it was A, I want to find someone, and B, I know where someone is because trying to locate people actually 
um, on there was a really difficult thing. So um, people could record that, like, I know someone's safe, all that sort of thing. But um, it, it makes it makes a difference. So Joe shared um, emergencywa.info, and also there's a Victorian bushfires. Um, there's the fire ready app, which I know was used by a lot of people, and it's just about information, um, especially that came out of uh, Black Saturday, which was five years ago this year, just recently passed. So um, this is a really interesting blog by Patrick Meyer. And um, it was interesting about what happens with um, human connection and what happens when people spread out or after a disaster. So highly recommend uh, reading this blog about, um, and what I loved it says, to this end, they also analyzed the communication patterns of mobile phone users outside the affected area. Um, so the question driving the study was, how do the communication patterns of non-affected mobile phone users affected from those affected. And I think this is what I really discovered with the Tasmania bushfires. Um, I will push it up. If you Google Piggy for me, um, uh, Patrick Meyer, and then we'll, we might, I might find it later. Thanks, Piggy. Um, he's on Twitter down below. So we're going to the next slide. And this is another thing. This is about um, digital volunteers, and I guess the reason I'm, I'm getting to is that just because you're not in the affected area doesn't mean you actually can't help. And this is what I think digital humanitarianism is all about, um, especially using the power of technology and the power of PLM. So this is a standby task force. Um, it's got request activation for what we do, the model deployments, and then a TED video, um, which is Patrick Meyer talking about um, changing the world one map at a time. There's also the Digital Humanitarian Network, and this is groups where it's been set up um, to engage uh, digital networks with a 21st humanitarian response. And also, it's great to actually be able to I guess educate our kids that we're teaching um, that people are actually People can actually help. I know personally, for me, um, I lost a former student in the Black Saturday bushfires five years ago, and I didn't do anything. Um, I think probably you know, a bit grief stricken. And for me, when the bushfires happened in January last year, um, it was time to actually do something. So this was um, a really good thing to do. So. I guess the reason, and it's all about storytelling, but for me it was, I was born in um, Tasmania, so it's a little island that's south um, of mainland Australia, and I left um, back in uh, 1997 to come to university. So I live in Melbourne now, and it, it's a call to action. Um, you know, schools burnt down. Um, it was a primary school called Dunaway Primary School, a little tiny primary school on the Tasmanian uh, Tasman Peninsula. And um, with teachers, you know, teachers never take their resources home. So um, I thought, oh, you know, how can I help? And, and this is the biggest thing. You're definitely right. Um, people are often, you almost get um, overwhelmed going, I don't know where to start. And, and this was probably the biggest way that I actually could help. And then definitely, you know, if anything else came up, again, this is how I definitely helped you know, using the power of social media. So Tasmania is this little icon down here. This is the island. And um, it makes um, it makes it sort of hard to you know, realise how far away you are, but this is a map of Tasmania, and all those little red pins are where fires were burning on the 4th of January in 2013. So there was a fire at Vishno, um, one in the Midlands, and the ones that are down the bottom, you can see where it says just below above the Tasman National Park, um, these are the ones that have all that red line is where the main um, main fires were. 
and you've got it, what you've got to explain understand about the Tasman Peninsula was there is uh, a channel that separates Dun Alley um, from the mainland. And so what happened was those who were stuck down Port Arthur for those um, who are listening in um, is down where it says Tasman, just in Tasman National Park, that's their Port Arthur, which is the convict um, settlement, quite famous. Um, so there's a lot of holiday makers um, that were there and so people were basically stuck and there's a vibrant um, aquaculture community so there's all these oyster, um, oyster hatchlings which needed um, yeah, power. So holiday makers definitely, so January is a peak time um, in Australia, so a holiday um, time, so just after New Year and uh, people, you know, um, have higher cars and, um, and they just had to leave them because they just had to get them off, had to get them off the peninsula. So, I need to go to the next slide. So this is a view from Hobart on the Saturday, the 5th of January. Now, Tasmania is probably the closest to the ozone layer like you're in New Zealand. Um, and so people don't realise how hot it can get. So, a 39 degrees is very hot um, in Hobart um, and it had been, you can say this is the Friday which is the temperature, I think at 4 o'clock it was 40 degrees, it was very, 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 very hot and so there were fires sparking everywhere. So this is the view from Hobart um, on the Saturday and of course there was fires, pretty much there was a lot of fires everywhere else. Uh, but that was a very hot day last year. Yeah, the other problem, Peggy, was it was quite polluted. Um, and Hobart's sort of in a valley. Um, so that's one of the powerful photos there, and I'll show you some more in a minute. So this is probably another one. So um, Mount Nelson Signal Station, if you ever go to Hobart, um, Mount, Signal, Mount Nelson Signal Station is probably one of the best places to look at. So it's looking out to the, the New Zealand way. And you can see that line of fire um, coming through where those lights uh, is obviously residential, but um, it's just an amazing, amazing view. So it says um, Denali's on the right of the picture, um, and Richmond's on the left of the picture. So it, you know, basically um, they were, ta were taken out. So. So what happened with social media was no Irons actually set up a page called Tassie Fires where you can help. Now um, at one stage, um, I think it was 6,000 people um, actually talking about it and, and share, share out things. But she set it up, um, she offered her house and, you know, getting people to um, help out. And then she said, oh, I set up a Facebook page and then invited her friends to help and she was just overrun. So Mel Irons was an individual. Peggy, if you just literally, and I'll, um, if you just Google Mel Irons, um, her boyfriend um, actually is an ABC journalist, um, but she just basically set up Facebook groups and then just it spread. And I actually found out from a friend of mine whose husband and family had gone to Don Alley. I mean, this is how I found out about this page and then I was tagging all my um, Tasmanian friends and it was like, oh, can you help? And, and this was just going on and it was it was huge. And um, I think I really started to learn the power of um, Facebook. Twitter was sort of going off as well, but it was, um, it, was in, it was really interesting to see what was going on. So... After I got started with that, I actually helped with two pages. Um, one was um, Tassie Fires We Can Help, Boxes of Caring. So I helped sourcing um, interesting places to um, get into, like products from. And then I um, also set up um, Crillo for Kids. Um, Quillos is, is a, basically a quilt that gets um, sort of put into a side of pillows. It's, one, it's a piece, one piece of material and 
get told up into us and I thought that'd be a really good idea for me. So I actually um located um someone in Hobart because I needed someone on the ground to organise it for me. Um and so she organised it from her end and then I just sort of shared it out on Twitter and found all the and this is where Twitter was really powerful. So tagged craft, tagged quilting, tagged sewing, you know, any of the words that I could do. And it was just amazing to see the response. And um, what they also did, um, she's the, I think she's the Queen, Queen, um, Queen Bee for Crafting. And I'll find the details. But um, they did um, uh, Woolies for Tassie. And it was just an amazing um, experience to be involved in because all the information um, was gathered on Facebook and they put things together and um, I'll just find it here. So the Hive Queen, I'm just putting it up now, but the amount of squares, so basically what it was, um, they created um, they created all these projects and it was just amazing. So, just finding the link now. I'll just put the link in the chat room. Oh, Quillos. <laughs> yeah, so it's Quillos for Kids. Was the, um, but I'll just put the link in about the square. So, what basically. Um, they organised them in squares and they put them all into blankets for people who had lost everything. Because you've got to remember, down on the um, Chesham Peninsula, all of them were shack owners um, and people had lived there all their lives and they'd, their houses weren't insured, shacks weren't insured. So, you know, they'd lost everything and, and it's such a tight knit community. So, the Facebook group, Facebook was, had definitely become a medium because you could upload files and, and share it out, um, you know, tagging and things like that. So. Um, it really made a difference um, to, to help out. I think this is probably the most powerful um, picture, and this is of the Walker family. So the grandfather's taking a picture in this one, and so there was five kids. Um, the grandmother's, grandmother's holding the youngest, and you can see how orange um, it actually is all around. So there. Um, grandparents' house and the dad's, the mum and dad's house were up on the hill, and they basically escaped into the water because there was nowhere else to go. Luckily, they found a uh, dinghy. Um, grandfather had to run back and get the dinghy and, and drag it down so that they could um, go. But this is probably the um, most important picture that probably affected people, and it just sort of explained really um, how dire it got. And what was more powerful was um, the dad was actually away um, camping up in the northwest of Tasmania and now they see um, found him and, and brought him down because he had no idea because he was out of range um, what was actually was going on. So for me it's about community and it's about really making a difference um, with whatever you've got. And I think having watched now um, my the Tasmanian bushfires, but um, the fires in Sydney last year, the fires in Western Australia. Um, I haven't really had any major floods um, in Australia at the moment, but um, you know, definitely with typhoon, um, with the typhoons ones, it's it's a really interesting thing that you have to deal with. Um, in the future, and you don't really know um, how it's going to make a difference until you actually get to that pace, um, or you know someone who's actually um, actually involved in it, and that's what probably the biggest thing that I've actually enjoyed. Um, you go, you go. That's, that's what you do. You just get in there and you do it, and you help out. And it's something that I'll never ever forget. And the other thing is, it's built a stronger community. You don't, especially with Tasmanians, 
you don't realise actually where everyone else is. And so I got to connect with um, Sue Wyatt and Danielle Batty and some other Tasmanian teachers um, and, and connecting in a way that I probably wouldn't have um, done so before. So I documented um, Peggy probably, I wrote a blog post, um, The Splash, which is the ABC um, Teachers and Kids website. And I probably will go back and write something later on. We'll get a few more stories. But I think in the stage that it happened, um, the buys happened on the Friday. And um, by the Saturday, the Facebook page had gone off. And on the Monday, I managed to track down the school um, principal. And so I think Matt, I don't know Matt lost his, I can't remember the Matt lost his house, but um, I've been put in touch with um, some of the teachers and there's some really interesting things that were going on. And, and you can see that on the red tricycle and there's a story behind that. What had happened was uh, Jen Eddington, who was, was um, the president of the Parents and Friends Association, had put up a list on a temporary website of all the items that they wished for. And one of them was a red tricycle because the year sixes had given um, the incoming kindergarten students, because kinder is part of Tasmanian schools, uh, unlike the rest of Australia. And basically, they ended up getting six red tricycles um, because the school had obviously um, lost them. And, and so that was the biggest problem, and I think that's what kicked me into action, was the fact that um, I joined an email list of a group uh, Jen Eddington and a few others, uh, Julie Mitchell, Fiona Lucas, uh, Robin here in Melbourne, um, and there's a few other teachers and parents. And there's email chains going backwards and forwards, and we were just not going anywhere. And I know definitely that was an experience um, with Black Saturday. They were not getting the things they really needed, but getting lots of other things, and they're just nowhere for it to go. And it's also I guess what happens with, with Mel was she jumped the red tape. Um, there was nothing in procedure because Tasmanian hadn't had really bad bushfires for a very long time. And it was a matter of just reaching out to the community and saying, okay, here's what can happen. Um, and from that, what was really interesting was the Tasmanian police now have a Facebook page. They have a Twitter page and the same with the Tasmanian Fire Service. So that they can keep information on. So when there was bushfires again um, this season, people were onto it straight away. So in this image, it says what generally occurring quite before fires and after fires. So you've got to remember this used to be a district high school. So for our international guests, a district high school is where um, a primary school and a high school are kind of merged together. It's usually district meaning rural. So um, it's obviously a small community, like with any rural community, a school is the glue that is part of the glue that holds it together. So the only thing that wasn't damaged um, was the school um, gym or PE um, or school hall, and but everything else was. And in such a small community, um, you know, as I said, the school is the thing that it holds. So. Okay, um, the question that's just been asked was, yes, they did have to um, tear it down. No, they haven't rebuilt, but the plans are, they have temporary um, buildings in there at the moment. And um, they're in the process of putting underway um, more permanent things. The problem with a bushfire, and this is you don't realise, is that um, when a bushfire tears through an area, you actually have to start all over again. So you've got to clear the soil because the soil becomes contaminated. And the problem was when these fires started, that was January the 4th. Our school in Tasmania goes back in the early February. So they had to move so quickly um, just to get things started again. So my relationship with the principal was that I'd ring him up going, tell me just what you need. And, um, and then we were sort of dedicated. So Julie Mitchell took... Um, 
charge of the maths resources. Robin took care of the literacy. Um, mine was music and ICT, and we sort of um, everybody sort of had an area to look after. So we didn't double up. And I think that's the biggest thing in any disaster is that you have clear boundaries. Um, because the problem is you have too many helpers, and um, or people, and people just starting to cross over. So once we set up the document, which I'm just about to show you, it was really clear about what was actually going on. So the other thing that was really important was it was important to have connection with business and the community, and actually reaching out. Um, that's just stepping outside Tasmania. And one of the things that we um, I relied on for me especially was I collected music resources with the um, aid of AMUSE, which is um, the Music Teachers Association of Victoria, so classroom music teachers. And I um, teed up with them to um, help replace what had been lost in the music classroom because like um, we all know as teachers, we don't take our resources home. After over school holidays or over summer break or winter break, we need our resources at school, we don't take them home. So the music teacher had lost her CDs, um, they weren't on iTunes, she had not loaded them, um, and a lot of old sing books. Um, so for those our international guest sing books were put out by the ABC in Australia and they fantastic resource, and they still are a fantastic resource. But yeah, you definitely appreciate the cloud um, a lot more when you have those backups. But even things like basic instruments, you know, they had a drum kit and an amps and, and because music is, I'm a classroom music teacher by trade, um, it was somewhere that um, I was really passionate about helping. But I actually have a further connection and, and that was when I was in my third year of university, so back in 2000, um, my high school was deliberately burnt down in three separate places. They deliberately set another fire up another school in um, Latrobe back in Tasmania. And coming from the music department, we had um, a band program um, that was our classroom program, so all the musical instruments actually melted, um, among other things, and um, like science, you know, labs and everything went up smoke and and um, you know the school community even though there's more high schools in the area um, it, it just destroys it you know you, you, you certainly become a lot stronger but you don't realize how much value and the music teachers don't take this stuff home certainly with them so um, my other passion is about um, ICT and technology and so as I ask the principal like you know what do you want just you know, tell me what your wish list is, and, and I rang the music teacher. I think she got a bit of a shock, um, Carol and Big Mill, and I said, just just tell me what you want. Give me the wish list, and I'll find it. So I contacted um, Optimum Percussion in Sydney, and uh, heads with Amy's, and some of the teachers from Amy's had lost stuff in the Black Saturday fires, and it was beautiful. One of the teachers had written a amazing handwritten note saying that someone had helped her and she just wanted to pass on stuff as well. So um, it was things like sheet music and choral music and how Leonard um, donated some beautiful choral resources because she had some choirs. Um, and, I, and I found that with donations, um, this is just to to anyone in the future, when you're going after donations, be specific exactly what you want. So I, used to, I just went through the catalogue and going, actually I really like some boom records. Because um, Carolyn, um, it's a speech and drama teacher, or she's got a speech and drama background, and, and so I wanted as much stuff to support her in the classroom. And so for me, the most important thing was to really support her, and I bought her um, one terabyte hard drive and um, sent it down. So what we did was um, Taz Freight, which is a freighting company based in Melbourne and Tasmania, and um, we had, we've got a pallet. Um, they sent everything over for free, and we had a pallet, and, um, loaded everything up and so xylophones and, and some boom records and cold sheet music and, and we managed to get some guitars, three quarters and full size and some violins and recorders and you just, I was just so blown away um, by the generosity um, and some iPads were donated and I was really blessed that um, 
some other people donated to iPod Touches, to iPod Touches, and I reached out via Twitter. Um, on the organisation and said, you know, hashtag TASFILES, hashtag Dick Pelly and hashtag Slide to Learn and explained, explained the background of why I needed help and it was just, it was an amazing feeling. And Fiona Lucas, from my respect online, set up an event right and we, you know, we're specifically things like lunch boxes and so Blunston, which is a shoe company here in Australia, makes um, school shoes and boots. They donate a pair of shoes for every single child at school, regardless of whether they'd lost um, anything. And like lunch boxes for the kids and school bags. And But it was such a quick turnaround. Um, we really didn't have much time. But with the, um, the Crillos and the craft, it was, it was just amazing in the car of Twitter. Um, but I must admit, the first week, I just kept checking social media, like, okay, what, what's coming in, you know, what can I, if I don't know someone, I, you know, I'll refer to someone else, and I'm like, oh, I guess I can help. So, from that point of view. Um, but for me, this is where it really comes in, and this is, I'm having email conversations going backwards and forwards, and things were starting to get doubled up. And they just had, someone was organised, had an Excel spreadsheet, but of course with Excel, it's static. And I suddenly had a brainwave and we called the group, I called the group Teachers Angels because that's what we were there for, was to really help the school out and, and get the teachers back on their feet. And um, so, and we had this whole email team going. So what we did was I set up a Google, just a simple Google spreadsheet. And um, Google spreadsheets probably aren't my forte, but I was blessed to have Janelle Batty and Sue White come in and so things like staff room items, student items, kitchen items, gardening tools, um, and outdoor items. And what was the really key thing was, um, so we had all these tabs along the bottom. Um, so the name of the item, the food place to donate it, where it was going to be delivered, um, and then we went from there. And the Department of Education was also, from Tasmania was also in on so they could see what was coming in. And after about five days, they actually took over the Google Doc because it was just so it was just so overwhelmed and blessed with the things that would come through that there was enough to start a school. And once they'd made the decision, because originally it could have gone that they would just move those students off site and um, basically bust them, but um, the community really rallied around to get them started. So. Um, once that was just started, they had to clear the school site because obviously that contaminated soil and then basically start from scratch. So the portables came in. But what I really learned about that Google Drive was it was active and it was just so nice to actually come in and see um, when those emails were coming in, had the information, it was collaborative, it was real time and everybody um, could actually see what was going on, including the government. And what was important was the principal also could um, know that some of those things were actually being taken care of. He could just concentrate on his staff. Um, they had to work out at a fire station um, because obviously they, they had no officers and um, yeah, all of these things that were sort of going on. So what my encouragement is use your peer learning, use your professional learning network, develop it around you. And no, the fire station didn't burn down. Um, it was a question that was just asked, but use your PLN and use what's around you. Um, Twitter is a very powerful thing. If you know what hashtags to use, you can reach out for help, especially when the I know it was, it was definitely the Typhoon Land and family members back in the Philippines were trying to sort through that information. Um, I remember we were sitting with bushfires. I was watching friends who actually lived up in Stillwater and those areas around there. Um, and you could sort of check on and see what was going on. So you can actually help, especially when you're not there. So here are just some of the tweets. Um, Mick McKinn is one of the Greens leaders who's a, a politician in Tasmania. And um, I remember one of the mornings, um, I think it was a Sunday morning, so it was the third day, and I had 60 emails to deal with in two hours because it was just 
been too much for um, someone, one person to deal with. So I had 60 emails to respond and answer and file and, and do all that sort of stuff. So um, that square you can, was really powerful. So you can see where I've um, tagged the top one, the 774 Melbourne, so that's um, the ABC radio station in Melbourne. I had a quick phone to you. Um, questions just come through, where do you store all of those materials? Well, um, basically there was about four collection points in Hobart and then they got shipped down once there was, and there were some containers that were sort of set up. Um, I still don't think they've emptied all their containers because the school was set up in portables, they just didn't have all the room to store them. But they were sort of coming in um, bits and pieces. So um, you can see the TASVIA hashtag and that's where I've um, sourced the boxes um, we care. Uh, and Jane Caro um, is really passionate about helping with education so they you know, shared, shared there as well. No, the hashtag was already created. TASVIA um, was created I think by Mel Owens to start with. And then that's where we can, um, that's where we got off. So, um, 93.6 Hobart is the ABC radio station, of course. Um, radio, national radio is a very key part of um, any emergency. My sister works for the ABC in Wagga, and I know when there's um, a disaster going on, um, they have to do the radio, they have to do the updates every half an hour. Um, the Age is a national new, uh, newspaper in Victoria. Sun Across News, so they were updating his regular post because it sends those images and information. Um, Steve Collis wrote a blog post to also um, get some help out and he's an educator in New South Wales, he's very active on Twitter. So this is um, the first day of school term, so it's four weeks, the 16,000 hours crammed into four weeks of building and I'll just See if I can find the website. So you can see what the actual school is like because that's, um, I guess, a really powerful thing. Go to, so this is New Dunelly School, and you can see what I don't know whether they've updated it recently, but you can see some important information about what is actually going on. Um, and you can see some of the portables and actually the building process. So I guess the most important thing is about um, they've done some community kitchen work, but, you know, um, Elizabeth Knox was um, from the Daniel School Association Jennington and it was really good to see um, the community um, pull together and actually see what was going on and, um, it was just a really, even the books, like they had a um, book collection. Yep, they rebuilt that just in four weeks. It was just amazing. They had to, they had to um, pull a, a lot of things just to get all the uh, maintenance, but a lot of people sort of volunteered their time and actually an effort. And um, like I said, a lot of people, a lot of kids donated their books to the school library. They had over 2,000 books and they set up a um, Facebook page. Um, and they really made a difference because the kids were um, so you think of the cost of replacing the library is so expensive and um, a lot of these schools were brand new and I contacted um, one of the authors um, and she wrote, one of the authors wrote um, there's lots of books um, that this lady wrote I'm just finding now. A Diary of a Wombat by Jackie French. And Jackie French was um, amazing in her help because um, I contacted her um, and said, I'd love to, you know, um, one of the things that was asked for was, was um, Jackie had written some books. Um, about Australian history but it's fiction and it was um, really interesting to see um, actually how she, she'd been, uh, her school had burnt down when she was nine years old and 
talking about the sex anyway. So she got put in touch with the publicist and she sent down um, her books as well. And Neil Gaiman actually visited the school and they um, he did also helped out with the concert. And we actually flew in by airplane and donated his whole entire collection of books. Um, but uh, Jackie donated um, Baby Wombat print and um, and hopefully one of these days it you know, be nice for her to get down. But the most important thing is you can reach out. And, and I, I think my biggest lesson is that if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, there's some really basic tools that we can use um, as teachers to help educate our students that we can help. It's not just about doing nothing. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that I learned. You, you just don't. There's power in um, social media. So there is, um, you know, bushfires on or earthquakes or whatever it might be. There's nothing to stop people from actually getting in and offering help. And this was the, the practical way of helping out. And being especially with Facebook and, and just making those connections. And some of those connections will be made for life now. I still keep in touch with the, the teachers and and especially when one of them was, um, her place was nearly under threat from bushfires. It's great to see the power of Twitter and Facebook and just, you know, just check if she was okay. So one of the things that happened was Janelle Batty sent up um, a Dunnoy Primary School Pick Me Up project. So the problem with most disasters is after that has happened, these people forget about them. So whether it's Christchurch or whether it's you know Queensland after the floods or Black Saturday or too many bushfires or even the recent fires in uh, Western Australia, people forget, if it's not in the news, people forget about it unless you're directly involved. So um, Janelle set up a just through Google survey first and, and got people to sort of volunteer to either help a teacher support a teacher or to support a class um, and it might be little encouragement and mine was to support one of the teachers who I'd chosen um, just to sort of keep her encouraged um, and she sent me some photos uh, about midway through the year of the kids playing musical instruments and it just um, certainly brought a tear to my eye to see that um, yes I did have a music room but and I was in the local church hall, but you know, they were all playing music and it was definitely therapy for them and um, even the Tasmania Sydney Orchestra offered to come out and visit. Um, so there's some of their team members. So my challenge to people is what's stopping you from getting involved? Um, you never know if you don't ask and would you help if the situation arrived? That's it pretty much, Peggy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan. This has just been so informative for me because I wasn't hearing a lot of detail. And the detail was in the stories, and the stories that you told really made that real for me. Um, and what a powerful message related to the use of social media. I mean, I can't imagine how that could have been accomplished without it. And I and I know I, I commented a little earlier on that you can't wait until there's a crisis to start building your PLN. I mean, it's so clear to me that you had so much of that in place that you could immediately tap into. And we all know how social media works and that you, each one can reach out to all the people who follow them and they follow, and it can very quickly grow way beyond that initial group of friends. So I really appreciate your sharing that story with us and the powerful message. And I do want to thank everyone who joined us. We have been recording this, so it will be published very soon on our website. I want to remind all of you that it's important to log out so that the recording will process. And when you log out, you should get a survey that will give you an opportunity to provide Megan some feedback on this session. 
And if you didn't get to hear the whole session, like Lex didn't get to, um, definitely go back and listen to the recording. And you have an opportunity to even earn a badge for participating in the conference. So thank you all. And I will stop the recording and see you in the next session.